You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, award-winning lighthouse volunteer and killer miniature golf player. Hey, Cindy. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. I'm actually a little out of practice, so we might have to go sometime. Okay, you're on. We'll definitely have to do that sometime. <laughs> today is August 1st, 2021, and this is episode 130, 130 of Lighthearted. Today we have two guests. First, we'll talk with my good friend, author and lighthouse historian, Eleanor DeWire. And then we'll talk with Bill Gicker, director of stamp services for the U.S. Postal Service, about a new set of mid-Atlantic lighthouse stamps that's being released in a few days. You know, I'm not really a stamp collector, but I do have quite a few lighthouse stamps I've collected over the years. How about you, Cindy? Are you into stamp collecting at all? Only if they're of something special to me, uh, definitely including lighthouses. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Like the stamp of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, uh, of maybe? Of course, yes. Okay, yeah, it came out in 2013, one of the earlier sets of uh, lighthouse stamps. But we'll be talking about that shortly. Uh, but first, before we go to the interview uh, with Eleanor DeWire, has anything interesting happened on this date in lighthouse history? Yes, I'm glad you asked. On August 1st, 1859, Fenwick Island Lighthouse in Delaware was lighted for the first time. The 87-foot-tall lighthouse is very close to the transpeninsular marker that defines the eastern end of the border between Delaware and Maryland. After the light was decommissioned in 1978, a crusade led by Paul and Dorothy Pepper led to the lighthouse being leased to the state of Delaware. Paul Pepper was the great-grandson of one of the keepers. Today, the site is managed by the friends of the Fenwick Island Lighthouse and the tower is open for climbing. Also, on August 1, 1919, the American character actor Struther Martin was born in Indiana. He appeared in many westerns and is best remembered for his famous line in the movie Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. Quote, what we have here is a failure to communicate, unquote. He once said, quote, age is as much an asset for character players as it is for good wine. Human experiences, both good and bad, leave their marks on one's face and bearing, unquote. So, Cindy, let's tell everyone about Eleanor DeWire. Eleanor DeWire. Sure, Jeremy. Eleanor DeWire is an award-winning author, editor, public speaker, educator, and blogger based in Connecticut. She began her writing career with freelance stories for a Florida newspaper, and in 1987, she published her first book, Guide to Florida Lighthouses. Since then, she's authored some 20 books about lighthouses. From 1991 to 2000, Eleanor wrote two regular columns for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Mariner's Weather Log, one about the U.S. Life Saving Service, and one on lighthouses. She continues to contribute articles on lighthouses to various publications. She's also written early Victorian-era novels, plus four books and a number of articles about amateur astronomy and sky watching. Eleanor was awarded a short fiction prize in 1992 from the National League of American Pen Women. She is also the recipient of the Coast Guard Meritorious Public Service Award. She serves today on the board of directors of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and chairs the Society's Education Committee. I've known Eleanor for many years. I've been wanting to do this interview since we started this podcast, uh, and I'm really glad uh, we're finally doing it. So she's one of the most important lighthouse historians around. She's also a great person. Uh, we just did this interview very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, and let's listen to it now. I'm speaking today with my good friend, Eleanor DeWire, who is uh, joining me from her home in Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today, Eleanor. Thank you, Jeremy. It's my pleasure. You know, uh, we were just talking. We've known each other for, I'd say, in the neighborhood of maybe 25-ish years. And, you know, when I started this podcast, one, you're one of the people I really wanted to have on ASAP. So I'm very happy we're finally able to arrange this. So thank you again. Sure. You know, I remember meeting you at a, a book signing back in the uh, the olden days, and uh, well, maybe not that long ago. But anyway, I remember uh, you know being a little bit in awe of the famous author Eleanor DeWire. Your work certainly had an influence on me, and we'll we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, so you've been writing about lighthouses since about 1980, is that right? Yeah, that's that's in the neighborhood. Yes. And what 
originally sparked your interest in lighthouses? Well, I think it had to be uh, moving to Maine with my new husband, who was uh, at that time a young Navy guy. And uh, we didn't have much but each other, but we liked to go out and explore wherever we moved. And uh, Maine had a lot of great things to see. And my favorite was lighthouses. The first one I saw was Seguin off Popham Beach. And uh, I was just uh, captivated by it. I, I thought somebody's living out there and taking care of that. And what a neat story that is. Yeah. And it just went from there. Well, Maine is certainly a perfect place to get interest in lighthouses. And Seguin's one of my favorites. It's a pretty spectacular place. It sure is. And do you have an estimate of how many lighthouses you've visited at this point? You know, I really don't. I, I used to keep track. I would write them down in a notebook and uh, it pretty much got filled up. And then uh, I, I just stopped counting. And of course, the U.S. Lighthouse Society came out with the passports. And that was long after I started my interest. So uh, I never got one of those either. Mm -hmm. I guess it's it's over a thousand. Wow. You're way ahead of me. I think it's more than more than twice what I've what I've seen. The uh, former Coast Guard historian Dr. Robert Shina called you quote a driving force behind the recent upsurge in interest in preserving lighthouses and the history and nostalgia surrounding them unquote. So I think that's accurate. And uh, it seems like the the public interest in lighthouses has kind of uh, waxed and waned over the years. Uh, I think you were part of uh, kind of a surge uh, that happened uh, in the, the 80s and, and 90s. But where, where do you think all that stands today? I think it's still alive and, and well. A lot of uh, groups have formed since I first became interested. And, uh, you know, they're doing good work. Uh, they're, they're networking with each other. And uh, they're realizing the importance of saving this part of history and uh, as you say, it comes and goes, uh, but right now it seems to be uh, fairly stable. Another subject you've written a lot about over the years is astronomy, sky gazing, etc. How did you develop that interest? When I was a little girl, we had a telescope at home, and uh, my brothers would uh, train it on different sky objects at night, usually in the summer, and let me look. And I found that just fascinating. And then um, when I was uh, in my 30s, I got a job at Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut. And uh, at first, I was an interpreter in some of the vis uh, different exhibits. And then I drove the horses and carriages because I'd grown up with horses and cows and farm animals, and I knew how to do that. Uh, and then one day, the director of the planetarium came down to the horse and carriage venue and asked me if I would like to learn how to give planetarium shows. And I jumped at that and absolutely loved it and, and read and learned and just... I won't say I became an authority, no way, but I certainly uh, gained a lot of knowledge, enough to want to write about it. When I was a kid, I, for a while, I wanted to be an astronomer, but I think every kid goes through that that phase. But Yes, sure we, you... we grew up in the space age. You and I. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was sitting there in front of our black and white TV during the, the moon landing. Absolutely. So uh, you're a former teacher, of course, and uh, a lot of your writing has been named at Children, which is the Lighthouse Activity book, which I love. Uh, you're also chair of the U.S. Lighthouse Society's Education Committee. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about uh, what kind of education projects you have worked on and developed for the Society? Well, I think the Society brought me on board principally to gain a younger following. Uh, if you look at the membership and you look at the board, uh, we're comprised largely of older folks. Uh, and it's true, they have time. Uh, many of them are retired, so they have time to volunteer and travel and do these things. But we feel like we've got to get that younger group involved. And so that was sort of my uh, mandate when I came on board. And uh, so I gave them a lot of the stuff that I had been using in school programs and other activities. I was doing scout groups and so forth. They put a lot of that online. And then uh, 
I decided that I would start creating uh, materials that uh, I call them Monday morning because as a teacher, I remember what Monday mornings were like. And if, if you had a, a puzzle or a word search or an activity of some sort to get the kids settled down and ready for the day, that was marvelous. And I thought, what a, a grand time to give teachers something to do. It's very hard to connect with curriculum. I know a lot of Lighthouse groups think that they are writing curriculum, but honestly, schools have curriculum yeah. uh, and, and they know how to write it. They know how to do it. And they just want this extraneous fun stuff to do. When we're done with the day, we want to study something fun. And for me, it was always lighthouses and my students loved it. So I want that for other teachers. And so I'm in the process of creating uh, lots of fun things for uh, them to do. And also education kits, as I call them, that are linked to popular literature that I know kids are reading in school. Um, so I pick out lighthouse books. I think I can get uh, teachers to adopt and read and then craft a, a variety of activities around them. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that. We're putting up kids' art, uh, kids' uh, um, quotes, kids' poems, pictures of kids at lighthouses, anything we can do to say the U.S. Lighthouse Society has a lot of kids that follow it too. And coming up, I think we'll have a kid's passport next year, a kid's membership, uh, we'll really start doing some tours that are intergenerational and, and we'll get them on board. That's great. I, I heard about the kids' passport thing from uh, Skip Sherwood, who runs that uh, end of things, the whole passport right. program. So I think that's a, a great idea. Why is it so important to teach kids about lighthouses, do you think? Well, uh, we uh, older folks, <laughs> I'm not naming names, but <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just getting older. We'll step down eventually, and we've got to have some young interest, some young blood to take over this important legacy of saving lighthouses and their history and passing it along. And uh, so that's why we've got to get the kids involved. Plus, what better way for kids to uh, learn multidisciplinary things than to study lighthouses? I mean, it's, it's everything. It's, it's STEM, for sure, STEAM, as, as it's now sometimes called. So we get the science, the math, the reading, the writing, all the prongs of language are there, listening, speaking, reading, writing. It's all right there. And yeah. uh, I think that's very good for them. And if they develop a passion for that, even better. Absolutely. There was a local uh, fourth grade teacher near me here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, who I got to know, who every year did a, a lighthouse project. And uh, it included all those different disciplines that you mentioned, also even music. The music teacher wrote an original lighthouse song and the kids sang the song. Oh, great. So that was a, That's an fantastic. added component to it. Yeah, it was fantastic. Unfortunately, she retired. No, nobody's doing that exactly now, but anything along those lines is a great thing. Uh, so your book, uh, Guardians of the Lights, is one of my favorites. That's one of the books that really inspire me to get more deeply involved with lighthouses. I was just uh, looking on Amazon. I see it's still in print. It's probably gone through several editions. Over yes, the years. it has. Yeah, different covers and so forth. Is that your most popular book that you've written? I think it is. Um, when I first pitched it to my publisher in Florida, uh, they had done uh, my guide to lighthouses. And I told them, you know, that one was very popular. And I said, you know, lighthouses are just great. People love reading about them, visiting them and so on. And uh, I think this this will go. They were a little concerned about the heavy history that I added to it. But I think that I'm a fairly natural storyteller, so it it was readable and engaging. And uh, you're not the first person to tell me that that book got them interested in lighthouses. Uh, there's a gal out at uh, Cabrillo Lighthouse, Point Cabrillo mm -hmm. in California, and uh, she sent me a lovely email a few years ago and told me that uh, she read Guardians of the Lights and went straight to her local lighthouse and signed up to volunteer. Is that Jen Lewis? 
Yes. Yeah, I just interviewed her like a couple of days ago. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> for the podcast, wonderful. yeah. Yeah. She, yeah, she's so enthusiastic about lighthouses and uh, the work she does, so. She well, she's, she's a little younger, so I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, me too. I'm always so happy when people like that are involved. So you did a lot of research, obviously, for Guardians of the Lights, uh, which is about the, the lives of uh, lighthouse keepers. You interviewed a number of keepers. For yes. The book. It might be hard to just narrow it down to a couple, but are there a couple of stories in the book that especially stand out for you? Well, I spent a lot of time uh, hobnobbing with the keepers at New London Ledge Light. They were Coast Guard guys, and um, they really looked forward to my visits. Ray Rafferty at Project Oceanology would invite me along whenever he'd take a class out there, or he'd just take me out there. And, uh, you know, they, those guys who kept that light, there were five of them, four always on duty, and one ashore on leave. They taught me about real lighthouse keeping, uh, not the romanticized uh, version that we read in so many other books or we hear about. It was isolation. It was lonely. They argued with each other. They uh, were always looking for things to do. When I went into the rec room, supposedly, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, seamy novels <laughs> on the shelf and and um, I'll just say porn movies as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not what we think of uh, when we think of lighthouse keepers, but you have to understand the separation from uh, wives and girlfriends and family and uh, the the boredom, the tedium yeah. really came came to the surface with them. And then I, I interviewed a lot of uh, kids who grew up at lighthouses, and that was especially fun because uh, they talked about the special things that uh, they got to do as lighthouse keepers kids. And, oh gosh, there were so many of them. Uh, I, I did enjoy uh, Marjorie uh, Pendergast in Rhode Island. Uh, she went through the 1938 hurricane uh, and her husband was keeper of Watch Hill Lighthouse. And uh, she was actually married at the lighthouse. And one of the things that the storm took and ruined was her wedding dress, you know, and, and, and just fantastic stories of things that most of us wouldn't experience. So, yeah, I uh, my files are bulging with all of that stuff. And, I'm sure. Uh, and yours are too. So. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I interviewed a, a couple who were at Watch Hill for the hurricane of 54. Uh, I think that was Hurricane Carol, if I remember right. Yeah, so uh, being there for the hurricane of 38 must have been interesting, to say the least. It's a pretty exposed place, and the, that hurricane really socked the uh, south coast of New England. It did. So why is it so important that we remember the lives of lighthouse keepers and their families? Well, I think it was a very unique occupation. It... Uh encompassed a lot of things that people honor and appreciate and and uh, almost uh, has a, a religious connotation to it. You know, keeping the light for someone who's not home yet, thy brother's keeper kind of thing, the mm -hmm. rescues, the so forth. And, and so it was unique and with it being gone, when that chapter disappeared, uh, we really, really lost something. A lighthouse, uh, the word contains house, which to me says somebody ought to live there. They ought to take care of the place. You ought to be able to smell the cooking and, uh, you know, see the clothes hanging out on the line. And and that is all gone. So if, if we think about uh, saving the structures, that's fine. But we also need to save the stories and the people. I have a famous quote that's almost gone viral. I, I had no idea, but somebody started using it and it's, it's traveling around and it goes something like, uh, lighthouses are not just stone, brick, metal and glass. There's a human story at every lighthouse. And, and for me, that's the story I want to tell. Those, those lighthouses are cold and, and uh, emotionless without that. I couldn't agree more. I've seen that that quote online, and I think it's absolutely perfect. So I, I second everything you said there. Your book, The Lighthouse Menagerie, it's another one of my favorites. It's a lot of fun. 
I think that's it's the kind of book that's fun for anybody of any age. I'm sure a lot of kids have, have read it. Yes. Uh, what made you decide to write a book about animals at lighthouses? Well, the, the stories were rife in my files. I Every time I get in one of my files to find something, uh, an animal story would pop up or an animal picture would be there. And I began to think how important these these were to the keepers and their families and the, the safety and the health of a, a lighthouse. And I, I just thought, well, I shouldn't keep all this stuff in my files, I should share it. So I kind of stitched together an outline and, and uh, it kept growing bigger and bigger. I'm sure I could have added a lot more, but um, I think it gives people a sense of the need for companionship at lighthouses. Well, there's so many, so many great stories about, about probably mostly about dogs, but a lot of other animals too. And you wrote about, yes. are there a couple of stories from that book that especially stand out for you? Well, it's interesting you ask because I'm kind of fashioning stories now to go in uh, with the Keeper's Log, which is the U.S. Lighthouse Society um, journal. And now that we are trying to uh, appeal to kids and give them fun stuff to do, I I do an activity sheet for them each issue, and then uh, either Cheryl Shelton Roberts or myself write a story. And the very first story I shared was my absolute favorite. I met the people who experienced this. I wish I could have met the cat, but he's long gone. Um, it took place at St. Augustine Lighthouse. The, the kids were Wilma and Cracker Daniels, they lived there in the 1920s, 30s. And I met them when I gave a talk at St. Augustine quite a few years ago. And I said, you know, I've heard that story about the cat and how Cracker made a parachute for him and took him up to the top of the lighthouse and threw him off. <laughs> that, oh, man. That yeah. sounds kind of contrived and Cracker said, oh no, Wilma can tell you I did that. And and the cat's name was Smokey because he was black and Smokey ran away for about a month. I don't blame him. And uh, then he came back, but he always uh, was very careful when he was around Cracker and he didn't like pillowcases, which is uh. <laughs> what the parachute was made from. So I love that story. Absolutely. Yeah. Do not try this at home. Right. No, no, not yeah. with your kitty. That's a tall no, lighthouse. No, well, Eddie's Eddie's a little overweight, so I especially wouldn't try it with him. <laughs> Absolutely. I've got one of those too, Sadie. Yeah. You've written a, a number of guidebooks to lighthouses in different regions of the U.S. And, and let me just say, uh, I've also written some guidebooks and you've been so generous when I was working on them a couple of times. You, you've helped me. Uh, also, when I was doing a book on Minot's uh, Light in Massachusetts, I remember you, you helped me with that. And, you know, it's very generous of you to do that and not see it as competition. I think we're all on the same team. and not, oh, We not are. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that. No problem. And I appreciate all the help you've given me over the years, too. Well, you're so welcome. Do you have a favorite part of the country for visiting lighthouses? Well, you know, when I moved to the West Coast, I just fell in love with it. It's it's a beautiful coast. I've since seen more beautiful coasts in other countries, but our West Coast is pretty darn amazing. Uh, so, you know, starting there at Cape Flattery in the Northwest tip of Washington and working my way down through Oregon, Northern California, all the way down to San Diego. I just love that trip. I've done it, oh, probably half a dozen times now in various types of vehicles with bus tours in my motor home, uh, you know, just in a car with my daughter. And every time I fall more in love with it. Great lighthouses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I drove from San Diego to Seattle in a little Toyota Yaris uh, over the course of a month. Spent a, the last few days in British Columbia, actually, and uh, what a what a great trip that was. And you're absolutely right. If I had to pick one part of the West Coast, it'd be the Oregon coast. But the whole mm. whole West Coast has plenty to offer. It is a pretty amazing place. Of course, I'm partial to New England, but I'm not going to say one coast is more beautiful than the other. They're, yeah, they're just, just different. Like 
It's like saying that one of your kids or grandkids is your favorite. You just can't do that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, you've uh, also, of course, as you've mentioned, visited a number of lighthouses in other countries. And as a matter of fact, you and I spent quite a bit of time together on the U.S. Lighthouse Society's 2017 tour to uh, southeastern Scotland and uh, some of the east coast of England. We which was did. a great tour, yeah. I remember in Stratford-upon-Avon, we even went to a Shakespeare play together. That was a lot of fun. And we got lost coming back to the hotel in the dark. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's that's typical for me. But uh, I'd for, I'd, now that you mentioned, I remember that. I'd forgotten that part. But of course, we saw Shakespeare's bloodiest play. So it was an yes, interesting... Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> it was inter Titus Andronicus. It was an interesting evening. Uh, other than the U.S., do you have a favorite country for visiting lighthouses? I guess it's it's the region of the South Pacific. Uh, I've been to Australia uh, with my husband. I spent a month there with him one time, and uh, that was in Western Australia, and we saw a lot of lighthouses. Uh, and then uh, he and I did a tour to New Zealand a couple years ago, and oh, it's just so amazing. And it's it's more about the milieu, you know the. Uh, surroundings of the lighthouses and the flora and fauna you see. And uh, I remember at Rottnest Lighthouse uh, in uh, Western Australia, uh, there were these funny little creatures called quackas hopping around. And I absolutely love them. They're little marsupials and lizards. And I'm not so much for the snakes, but I get why they're here and why they were created. Yeah. Um, it's just a different landscape and uh, experience. And there are some very unique lighthouses down there too. Speaking of Rottnest Lighthouse, it was built by Aboriginal prisoners mm. who were, were kept on the island. And uh, it's a very sad story uh, about the clash between Westerners and natives and how the two did not understand each other. And uh, it, just a very sad tale, but uh, yeah. There was a big prison there and yeah they built yeah. the lighthouse speaking of the pacific uh you just told me i didn't know this until the last day or two but you're about to go to guam yes. this week can you tell I, us why you're going to guam <laughs> well i got a call last fall from uh, uh, a captain robert grant with the coast guard and he's on the committee that selects and helps out sponsors of sh new ships and the the Coast Guard high endurance cutter Frederick Hatch has been through her trials and was getting ready to schedule a commissioning. And normally they would have found uh, somebody in the family, uh, somebody that, that was a, a grandchild or a great grandchild or even a cousin to serve in this capacity. But apparently Frederick Hatch didn't leave uh, any family and so then uh, they, it's their job to choose someone they feel is deserving, someone who has worked on behalf of the Coast Guard and its mission and so forth. And it was me. I was absolutely shocked and thrilled. And, and when I told my husband, he did a couple of flips and he said, do you know what this means? <laughs> and I really didn't. It didn't sink in for a while. But uh, now that I'm leaving next week, I know I have to give some speeches. I have to get dressed up, which I hate to do, and um, shake hands with a lot of people, including the Commandant of the Coast Guard. I get a ride out to sea on the cutter and go to a barbecue with their crew. It's just going to be a great time, but the, yeah. the honor is just, oh, I can't get over it. And I yeah. thank you for asking. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. You certainly deserve the honor, and that, that's going to be an amazing experience. It is. And How long you. will you be in Guam? About 10 days. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's going to be a long flight out there. Have you been to Guam before? No, I've never been there. It's Micronesia. It's on the other side of the date line. I'm I trying to remember lighthouse-wise about Guam. Have it's a obviously of... pretty small, but... Um... Yeah. They have a couple of those fiberglass things. Yeah. That that some people like to take pictures of. I don't yeah. find them particularly charming. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm on your side. I, you know, they're, they're ace in navigation, but they're not, not, they're not exactly really cool. lighthouses. Not, yeah. not quite, not really. 
Another book of yours I wanted to mention is The Lighthouse Almanac, uh, which is a really neat collection of facts and anecdotes and so forth about lighthouses. That, I imagine, was an interesting, maybe fun book to put together, was it? It was, yes. And once again, it came about because I just have so much stuff, odds and ends that don't necessarily fit uh, in a history book or a guidebook or whatever. And, uh, you know, I thought all this gardening stuff and cooking uh, recipes, the the life of light keepers lent itself to uh, an almanac and so much of their life centered on the weather and uh, being uh, uh, self-sufficient. And so I thought, well, this is kind of like a old farmer's almanac. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a friend who designed book covers and she uh, came up with that lovely uh, sort of uh, <laughs> copy, copycat oh. look. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it was very fun to do. I'm sorry, it's out of print. I'd like to bring it back in. Yeah, well, I looked at uh, there's used copies available on Amazon, although if I remember right, it said uh, new copies available at a, starting at $190, I think it said. Have you seen that? <laughs> I have. Why am I not getting a royalty on that? I don't know. Yeah. But I think yeah. there's used copies available for a lot less than $190. Yes, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, in another lifetime, I interviewed Judson Hale, the longtime editor of Yankee Magazine and the Old Farmer's Almanac at his office in Dublin, New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, so I've interviewed the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac and the Lighthouse Almanac. I don't know if anybody else can say that. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. Clever. So let's uh, just talk about your fiction work for a minute. Obviously, I think we, I'm sure we could devote a, a show to that if this was a show about fiction, which is, but we have to stick mostly to lighthouses. But you've written some novels set in Victorian times, right? Yes, yes, early Victorian. Okay, early Victorian. What can you tell us about those? Uh, I'm a pretty decent fiction writer. I won an award um, oh many years ago from... Yeah the National League of American Pen Women for a story I wrote about Hawaii. And uh, I thought, gosh, uh, I must be pretty good at this. So uh, when I'm tired of writing about lighthouses, I'll give it a try. And I did need a break a couple of years ago. I felt like uh, I was just being asked to write about lighthouse ghosts <laughs> and things that I didn't really want to write about. And so I I went ahead and, and wrote a novel and it was very well received. It was about uh, uh, one of the prime ministers of England, uh, Charles Lamb, Lord Melbourne. And that was occasioned by seeing a PBS series and saying, as we often do, no, 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 that's not right. I, you're Hollywoodizing it and so yeah. forth. And I really thought that uh, it, I need to set the record straight, but I also was itching to try my hand at a romance novel. So mm -hmm. I did that one. Uh, I have I have two more and it's a very enjoyable uh, pursuit. You know, I still get to do a lot of research to make sure all the background material is right and the characters and the costumes and what they do and don't do. But uh, yeah, I just want my hands on the keyboard all the time. As a writer, you know how that is. You'd rather be doing that than than most else in your life. So this gives me a chance to, to do that. I do write under a pseudonym. Right. Yeah. JJ. Yeah, it's JJ Scott, J yeah. for John, J for Jessica, and Scott's my son. So I've got the kids and the husband there. Yeah. That's cool. I, I felt like I should reserve Eleanor Dwyer for the lighthouse books and work because that's that's what people know about her. Uh, but there's this other side of me, and so uh -huh. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. You know, I really admire people who write fiction. To me, it's so so complete completely different from writing nonfiction. Uh, and uh, when I was really young, I liked to write fiction, but I got away from it. And um, a few years ago, I started trying to write a novel. I'll let you in on a little secret. I don't know if anybody else is listening, but um, I started uh, writing a novel. I wrote about a hundred pages and I thought it started out good and I was getting kind of frustrated. So it's been on a back burner for a few years now, but I haven't given up on the idea. Uh, so I might pick your brain one of these days and, uh, you know, maybe get Oh, some absolutely. Stuff. I have yeah. one on a back burner right now because, mm -hmm. you know, the flow in your mind of where 
the story should go, sometimes it just dries up and you, you just have to put it down for a while. Yeah, yeah. Writing dialogue is the hardest part for me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Write, write dialogue that's interesting and believable and uh, keeps the story going. It's real art. And let me ask you a big question here. This is the $64,000 question. And uh, I've asked this of people before, but it's been a while, but I think you're a good person to ask. Why are lighthouses so fascinating to so many people? Well, they're associated with beaches and vacations for a lot of people, um, or, uh, or they have that overpowering, comforting uh, aura about them, almost religious, uh, the idea of salvation, of, you know, being your brother's keeper, as I mentioned before. Um, they're a symbol of a lot of things. And if you look around, you know that because they're on a lot of products and movies are still being made about them. We recently had The Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe and Robert Patterson, which was a strange, twisty one, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed it. So I, I think they just have have this appeal that's everything from beachy to I'm, my life is a storm and I need this symbol to get me through. And it does. Mm -hmm. And what do you think are the biggest challenges facing lighthouse preservation today? Money, money, and money. <laughs> you yeah. know, you never have enough money to do all the things you need to do. Um, taking care of lighthouses is similar to taking care of ships. Uh, you know, it's a, a whole instead of in the water into which you pour money, it's a hole beside the water in, right. into which you pour money. Um, they're, they're old structures. They have been um, redone over the years and not necessarily in a wise way. Uh, masonry is something that you really have to be careful with. And, and we see many cases where that's, that's been ruined by uh, good intentions. It's just a very difficult thing to want to take care of a lighthouse. But you know what I see that I really love is that every, every group has at least that one person who is crazy passionate about uh, what's going on. And I, I could give you a whole list of names of sure. people even today I know of who are doing that. And that's the glue that holds the groups together, that keeps them going uh, uh, inspires them to fundraise, to open the doors and let the public in. It's a very, very important part of lighthouse preservation. But, oh, do they need money? People donate, donate, <laughs> help yeah. them out. Yeah, I agree with you. There's some amazingly passionate people. Uh, and usually there is one guiding, you know, visionary type person with the different preservation groups. But as you mentioned before, uh, none of us are getting any younger and, uh, you know, we need need new people involved. This, I guess uh, that question and answer maybe leads into this question. Why is the United States Lighthouse Society so important as an organization? Uh, it kind of serves as a clearinghouse for all the groups in the nation. And actually we have a huge international following as well. Uh, we're the, the headquarters for all things Lighthouse. That's what we are aiming to be. Uh, we even have that in our mission statement that we we want to be able to uh, uh, save the history, help save the structures, be the place that people turn to when they want to know more or, or they need to do research. And I've seen that since the very beginning of the society come to fruition. I was friends with Wayne Wheeler, the founder when he first started the society on his dining room table in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, thanks to his work and uh, a lot of other people's work, it has really become a huge success. We depend a lot on tours for our funding. People love to take the tours. They're great tours. I'll, I'll yeah. say that. I'll just say that even though uh, <laughs> I'm biased. You know, food is good. The lodging is good. The lighthouses are great. There's always people on board who give a little historical information. We play games on the bus. Mm -hmm. We're just a fun bunch. And, you know, if you're looking for a fun tour, that's that's what uh, we offer. So that's that's the big 
uh, income for us, but we'd like to see more involvement through membership and get more people involved in, in doing it. And of course, the kids mission is huge, that initiative right now to get them involved. And we've recently begun to give away money, which uh, uh, I cried and begged for years, please, please, even if you only give, you know, a couple of $500 grants a year, show that you're willing to share. And we've finally started doing that. The new board during, after the pandemic, uh, they gave away thousand dollar chunks to various groups. And before that we were giving away uh, upwards of 30,000 a year and it's only going to grow. So uh, we want, we want to answer that thing. We just talked about that lighthouses need money. Well, I always mention at the end of this podcast that donations and memberships in the U.S. Lighthouse Society support this podcast along with all the other education efforts of the, uh, the society. So I have one final question for you. And uh, being a, a teacher, uh, you know how important uh, bonus questions are. This is for bonus points now. Okay. okay. Extra credit. Got it. Exactly. Extra credit. Yeah. Okay. What has been your favorite part of your involvement with lighthouses or parts? Well, number one would be all the neat people I've, I've met. Um, you know, I, I told you earlier that the people story is, is what I really uh, care about and uh, like to share. And, oh my gosh, I've met some of the neatest people. Uh, I think I could go just about anywhere in the world and find a couch to sleep on because of the friendships that have been forged through this interest and passion. And uh, people embrace my whole family. Uh, my daughter recently went to a gift shop down in California and my books were there. And she just said to the clerk behind the counter, oh, that's my mother. And <laughs> they went bananas. Oh, you know, so. It's great. They embrace the whole family. Uh, John calls himself Mr. Eleanor DeWire because people will say, what's his name again? What's his name? Okay, it's Mr. Eleanor DeWire. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so it's absolutely the people. I've been able to get my hands dirty at a few lighthouses, which I, I like that. It doesn't happen often enough that I get to paint, uh, that I get to, to uh, scrape and, and, you know, clean and do all those things. But once in a while it happens. And I absolutely love that too. That's, that's the, the grit and the, the meaning uh, behind it for, uh, you know, for me. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, Hands-on is, is always good. It's kind of, uh, well, it's at the heart of what, what we do really. Uh, and you better watch what you ask for because uh, I might invite you to help paint the stairs at Portsmouth Harbor. Lighthouse. Oh, I love, do you know, Jeremy, I've never been up to the top of Portsmouth Lighthouse. Oh, I've that's got to change. That's I've got to come and see you and get a tour. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm one of the people to, to talk to about that. So uh, uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, definitely set that up at some point. Well, Eleanor, I, I knew this was going to be great. It has been great. I'm so happy. Uh, again, I've been wanting to do this for the two years since I started the podcast. Uh, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for everything you've done uh, over these, these years uh, for the Lighthouse community, for uh, education, on and on, for inspiring so many people like me to get interested in the Lighthouses. So. That is the nicest thing I've heard. Thank you. You can buy Eleanor DeWire's books through Amazon and other online booksellers. You can also check out her website at eleanordewire.com. That's E-L-I-N-O-R-D-E-W-I-R-E -E -E, and her lighthouse blog at eleanordewire.blogspot.com. In a few days on August 6th, the U.S. Postal Service is releasing a new set of Mid-Atlantic Lighthouse stamps. The stamps feature paintings by Howard Coslow, and they depict the following lighthouses, Montauk, New York, Navasink Twin Lights, New Jersey, Erie Harbor Pierhead in Pennsylvania, Harbor of Refuge in Delaware, and Thomas Point Shoal in Maryland. I spoke with Bill Gicker, Director of Stamp Services for the U.S. Postal Service in Washington, D.C., about the new stamps. Let's listen to that now. I'm speaking with Bill Gicker, who is the Director of Stamp Services for the U.S. Postal Service. 
And we're going to be talking about the new series of Mid-Atlantic Lighthouse Stamps that's about to be released very soon. Thank you so much for being with me today, Bill. Sure, it's my pleasure. First of all, how many stamps does the Postal Service produce in a year? In a year? Um, well, <laughs> it's that's a tricky question in a way because we have stamp issuances. And of those, we do between 24 and 30 a year. Right. Um, but then... Uh, number of designs, there could be m multiple designs within those issues. So that's usually a higher number, sometimes around uh, 120. Mm -hmm. And then if you talk about what's actually being manufactured and produced, the sheer volume of actual printed stamps, now we're talking in the billions. Right. Yeah, I think the number I saw in the article I was looking at was 14 billion. I guess that's the number yes. of actual stamps produced. That's right. But let me just ask, is that number going down uh, in recent years or? It, ha it has been going down, not dramatically, but it's mm -hmm. a slow decrease. Uh, of course, first class mail volumes are down. There's still a very strong interest in stamp collecting and people are certainly still using stamps, but, but uh, for certain things that were sort of a stamp go-to like bills, a lot of that is going online, of course. Sure. So about these, uh, this new set of five Mid-Atlantic Lighthouse stamps, mm -hmm. let me ask you, are they forever stamps? They are forever stamps. Okay. So it's my understanding there's something called the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, That's which right. is a panel that selects subjects for recommended stamp releases. Did that committee pick the lighthouses that are uh, shown on these stamps? Uh, the committee picks the subject matter. So that means if they decide they want to do a lighthouse series, they may have ideas, but we, we ultimately rely on experts. So we do it by region. And so a region, you know, we want some diversity in the, within that region, but we also want diversity within the images themselves. Often people think only of the, the, the tall lighthouse, but we wanted to show that there's a variety of types of lighthouses and do the best we could to represent various types within each set. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a great job has been done of that because you've got Montauk Light in New York, which is one of the most mm -hmm. best known and one of the oldest tall lighthouse towers in the country. Yep. You've got Thomas Point Shoal in Chesapeake Bay, which is the only surviving screw pile lighthouse on Chesapeake Bay and uh, National Historic Landmark. And, you know, this is a really good uh, selection, like you say, variety in the styles of lighthouses. So uh, Howard Coslow, uh, the, I should mention the late Howard Coslow, I believe he passed away not, not that long ago, but he was the it's... artist who did the paintings that are used on these lighthouse stamps. Uh, mm -hmm. He was kind of a legend. And uh, <laughs> he yeah, was. he did the artwork for some of the earlier lighthouse stamp series as well, and uh, many other things, as I understand it. That's uh, right. can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about him? Um, Howard was a, a, just amazing. He was a true gentleman and uh, a wonderful artist, and he was so passionate about whatever he tackled. And he actually was the artist uh, for this entire Lighthouse series. Um, and he often used his own photographs. So if he was going to take on a project, he would he would physically go out to these locations and um, and take photographs and gather his own materials and then start painting, uh, being well aware of, of the light sources and where the sun was coming up or going down in relation to the lighthouse. So being accurate and uh, knowing his subject matter was very important to him. So it, he just was uh, sort of amazing that way. Yeah, well, they're beautiful works of art in their mm -hmm. own right. They're really beautiful paintings. I know there was a uh, New England Lighthouse Stamp Series in 2013, five New England lighthouses. I was a bit involved in that, and uh, I'm, I'm very involved here with Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse on the New Hampshire Seacoast, and that was one of the five. Mm -hmm. We had a, a great day of issue event. I enjoyed that so much, actually, on my birthday in 2013, oh, so that nice. was a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of fun, which is eight years ago on the day we're speaking today. Wow. All right. Oh, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't trying to prompt you to say happy <laughs> birthday, but I just realized that was exactly eight years ago. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. And, you know, it was interesting knowing about that a couple of years before the stamps came out being sworn to secrecy. I'm sure you hear that from people a lot. Yep. Some of the people get told in advance, but are told not to tell anybody else. Exactly. It's like working, working for the CIA or something. <laughs> We take it very seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was, it was a lot of fun. Do you know how many Lighthouse Stamp series or how many, you know, sets of these five Lighthouse Stamps there have been uh, over time? There have been seven total with mm -hmm. this with this being the last one. Oh, okay. This, okay. 
La so, last one in this series, I should say, because we certainly won't abandon lighthouses, but of course, with the passing of Howard, we'll, we'll have to figure out a new way. Well, there's about 850 standing lighthouses in the country, so you've got right. a ways to go. <laughs> or you use, them, use them all up. Right. Have the lighthouse stamps been popular? Yes, the lighthouse stamps have proven very popular. I think there's a lot of people who just really enjoy lighthouses. They're beautiful and yeah, I, they've been mm -hmm. very popular. Yeah, I would think so. And what is the date these stamps are being released? Uh, these stamps will be issued August 6th in oh. Highlands, New Jersey. Okay. And are there any events uh, or is there an event planned there in, in Highlands, New Jersey as part there, of it? There is, yes. There will be a first day of issue ceremony. Um, stamp ceremonies consist of uh, speakers speaking to the subject matter. I think uh, Friends of the Lighthouse will be attending and hosting us. Um, and uh, it, it's just a celebration of, of the release of the stamps. That's a great site, great lighthouses, great museum in there. And uh, it's a good place to have an event like this. I happen to know there's also going to be a, uh, an event at the Annapolis City Dock in Annapolis, Maryland as well on August 7th, the next day at 2 p.m. So I did see something about that. And maybe some of the other locations are having events as well. Obviously, people will be able to get these stamps at the post office. I think everybody knows that, but are there other ways to buy them? Sure. Uh, USPS.com. You can get the stamps there. The stamps are actually available for pre-order 30 days before the issue in state, but then certainly online. Yeah. It's probably your easiest way. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I was just looking at, uh, the, there's still some New England, some of the New England set that came out in 2013 available on eBay and they've gone up a little bit in price. Yes. So yeah. I recommend that people buy them now rather than waiting uh, <laughs> eight or 10 years of looking for them on eBay. That's right. Bill Gicker, I really appreciate you spending this time with me today. You know, I know you're one of the busiest people in the world. So I appreciate you putting <laughs> a little, little time aside in your, your busy schedule. And no, uh, it's very nice speaking with you. The new Mid-Atlantic Lighthouse stamps will be available in a few days at post offices, and you can also buy them online by going to USPS.com and clicking on Store. And as I mentioned in the interview, you can find a lot of the older lighthouse stamps on eBay, such as the Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse stamp. That's right. Thanks to our guests, Eleanor DeWire and Bill Gicker. Thanks to all the members and volunteers of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, and a shout out to the staff at the Society's headquarters at the Point No Point Light Station in Washington. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about the Quarterly Journal, Lighthouse Tours, the Passport Program, the Lighthouse Research Catalog, and all the other things the Society offers. Remember that donations and memberships help support this podcast and all the preservation and education efforts of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. If you listen to this podcast using Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And please spread the word about this podcast on social media. Tell your friends who are interested in lighthouses. And if they're not into lighthouses, tell them anyway. Maybe they'll get interested. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt once said, quote, What is to give light must endure the burning, unquote. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Shine.